Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to our Wrestling Everywhere series. And who better to talk to about wrestling everywhere than the guy who has been so fundamental, not only in brokering wrestling relationships kind of all over the world and interpromotionally, but has wrestled all over the world, has held so many um, roles and positions and worn so many hats and so many different promotions. Who better to talk to than Rocky Romero about this? It is the day after Christmas at the time of recording this, and Rocky's making time for me. I feel so appreciative of that. How are you? How's your holiday season been? Holidays have been uh, quiet and good. I like quiet right now. You know, uh, like you said, I've been traveling so much uh, this year. It's been one of the most hectic years um, in my career. So uh, it, it's nice to just kind of be able to chill at home and hang out with the dogs and hang out with the family. And yeah, I'm, 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 uh, it's been a great Christmas. Yeah. Dogs are the best, aren't they? They're just they're the, the best. best. You have Duke and Honey, I'm sure right? They're, I think I had seen. Yeah, Duke and I, I'm sure <laughs> one or both of them at some point is going to come barreling through here at some point. Sure. But they, do, they seem to know whenever I'm on an interview, they seem to want to show up. <laughs> that, they want nothing to do with me. My dog and my sister's dog, my dog will just get along with anyone or at least be not problematic with, with anybody. My sister's dog is very territorial. So we were playing a lot of like dog chess over the holidays, but we all yes. made it. We all survived. But you kind of alluded to what a hectic year it's been. Um, and boy has it, but that's kind of been a huge part of your legacy in general, right? Cuban born. Um, wrestled all over the world in so many places. And I always save this question for the end, but I feel like it's a, a really great starting off point for us. Um, wrestling in so many different environments and in so many different countries. I, I once heard Chris Hero sum this up really well as Japanese wrestling being struggle through sports, British and European wrestling being physical and mental chess, Mexican wrestling being pageantry and acrobatics married and American uh, wrestling being morality play. I just thought those were so succinct and something that people might not think about as far as uh, like how much you have to adapt in different environments and in different crowds. Is that still something that you find a challenge or was that more challenging in your career? And do you forget where you are sometimes? Like you're, you're traveling so much and everything is is so different and have these different flavors. What is that like for you from the performance aspect? No, I think I think you've definitely got to adapt, uh, you know, to wherever you're you are, and uh, you know, every audience is, is different, and even every audience in America is different, you know, depending on the city sure. that you're in, uh, and, and as well, like when you break it down to countries and cities as well, you know, the the same way and the same things that you might do in Tokyo at Cork and might be completely different how you want to do it in you know somewhere you know off the beaten path in in japan you know in a smaller city so um so yeah i'm I'm always constantly thinking about that and uh you know but i, I you know you mentioned all these different types of wrestling and how they're presented but i mean in the end it's it's all the same you know and i i feel like it's all the same because the most important thing is is you know emotion and and kind of like you know what you're emoting to the public and to the fans and how they're going to feel that and react to it so uh when it, it's all said and done the the most basic parts of professional wrestling are still all the same you know and uh, i try to always remember that and i uh the way i wrestle even in mexico you know i'm not an acrobatic kind of wrestler you know compared to the guys who and, and gals who are down there who are much better at it than I would ever be. You know, they trained all their life for, for certain type of movements and things that, I, you know, at 41, I'm not going to try to start doing. But um, but I, I try to bring the elements that, you know, uh, you know, because I'm a, I'm a American wrestler wrestling in Mexico. So how can I stand out? And I want to be an American wrestler wrestling in Mexico exactly that way. You know, I want to be able to, to, to uh, you know, maybe focus more on psychology and tell uh, you know a, a shorter story within the match but also a longer story throughout you know the program or whatever uh the rivalry between um you know myself and, and whoever it is that's on the other side so um I, I try to bring those kind of elements to it so that my matches and moments actually stick out 
you know, more. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense that that differentiation can be something that plays to your advantage as well in these different mm -hmm. kind of environments. And I feel like this year more than ever, part of the impetus for starting this was seeing like scenes in different locations rise as a whole, rather than this person is from here and wrestling on a major promotion. And that is as far as kind of representation has, has reached in any way. Um, has it been different from you to see kind of so many different styles celebrated on TV? And I feel like you as much as anyone between the work in chaos and then not only that, but brokeraging these relationships on the other side to kind of see these um, different styles or, or different genres almost elevated in, in a way on American platforms and, and television. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, personally being able to see it in AEW, for sure, you know, they've been such a proponent for for wrestling outside of America and really trying to bring different things to American TV, you know, and I think that's what makes them stick out. You know, I, I think WCW obviously did it very well with the Cruiserweight division. And um, and now I feel like, uh, you know, Tony is doing the same thing now by really highlighting uh, certain towns from all over the world and, and highlighting, you know, like, for example, CMLL in general, like Mystico versus, you know, Rocky Romero and, uh, you know, being but to just highlight not only the wrestlers, but also the promotions. And like you said, the history that goes along with that. New Japan obviously has been a big part of AEW in the last two years. And I think he's done a, you know, a really good job of presenting that to his audience. And, um, Obviously, we're still seeing it in WWE in, in a different type of way, but it, it still feels like WWE is kind of pushing it in a WWE way, even though they they do obviously, you know, want the history. And I think like Triple H is is, is a bit more like got his finger on the pulse when it comes to that, as opposed to to Vince uh, when when he was running things. So. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's really cool to see you know, the world of wrestling being shown on the biggest platforms uh, that we have. And, um, but it, I feel like it's kind of the internet age of professional wrestling, you know, where like the world got smaller, you know, yes. it's, <laughs> you know, it used to be, you know, back when I was a kid, you know, it'd be, it'd be hard to find, uh, you know, Japanese wrestling, or, or maybe you might see Mexican wrestling on, you know, some cable network, like randomly at like 3am, you know, but like, <laughs> now, you know, a, a click of a button, and you can see and watch your, you know, your favorites from all over the world, so accessible so easily. And uh, I think that that's just kind of really starting to bleed through to the, uh, to the American scene, and, and the worldwide scene in general. That has been kind of in my discussions of the series, a common thread of um, it can sometimes feel like we're so oversaturated because we have so much wrestling, but at the same time, it's mm -hmm. more accessible than ever. So what's kind of cool is hearing about all of the differentiation and how you, how promotions have forced themselves to stand out because that accessibility is there, but you... Mm -hmm. I don't want to say you can't get away with as much, but <laughs> kind of you can't get away with as much. You really have to to be truly very organic to your own identity to to pop out, mm -hmm. which has been very cool. Um, I I find it very inspired and and awesome that a big part of your legacy is these interpromotional relationships when you debuted at Corquin Hall, right? I mean, you <laughs> you've been traveling since you were very very young and. Mm -hmm. um kind of had this more global mindset it feels like since in the very early development of your career where um i feel like a lot of maybe independent american wrestlers are working their loops or working their territories for lack of a, a better word um what was that like and was that fundamental in you building your wrestling foundation yeah i mean i was always inspired by you know chris jericho d malenko Eddie Guerrero, the guys who, who, you know, had these great, awesome careers outside of America and then decided to finally come to America and become big stars here. But, um, I, you know, I always found that inspiration through them and, and also that the way that they could, you know, pretty much wrestle anybody and, you know, from anywhere and 
you know, they were the go-to guys when you brought in, you know, Rey Mysterio or Psychosis or somebody, whether it was an ECW or WCW or WWF at the time, like they could bring them and plug them in. They know that the company knew that they would have the best guys with that talent, you know, so internationally. So, yeah, and I, I think that it's all, you know, it's all, uh, uh, you know, uh, a learning aspect too is you know uh, you know going to all these different places and learning how to wrestle in front of these different crowds and still being able to you know get as much as you can out of the match and 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 as much as you can out of the moments that it only kind of sets you up to you know really do it on a bigger stage right so when you get the the call to come to one of these big promotions in america that you'll you know you have the skill set already in place because you've already been there you've already wrestled in front of you know, 15,000 people, you know, there's sure. not a lot of, you know, it's not the same nerves, you know, as your first time, you know, I, I got lucky, like you said, I, I, my, my debut in Japan was Cork and Hall. And then my actually like real new Japan debut was the next day at, uh, at, uh, at the Tokyo Dome. So right. Was thrown right into the fire, you know, in front of like 40,000 plus people. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I, from, a, you know, an early, early on, I was, uh, you know, getting these kind of huge opportunities and trying to make the most out of them, whether I was ready or not, definitely not, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's a part of it too. So, you know, I, I've learned so much more from failure in, in professional wrestling than, than ever, you know, getting a win. And I, and, you know, now I'm, I'm, you know, seasoned veteran or whatever you want to say now. So like now getting these opportunities, you know, uh, like in Mexico, like a, it was a dream to always want to be a main eventer and, in arena mexico and to be in a hair match and kind of be the guy so this year you know cml threw me the ball and i tried to stick out as much as i can and and get people to talk about uh cml the product within mexico but also outside you know and that was like the, a huge huge goal for me was uh you know and it was a part of kind of the things that i said from right you know right off the, the bat when i got there was you know, I'm I'm gonna take CML global. I'm gonna take I'm gonna be the guy who takes it global, and uh, and I, I feel like I did a, a, a pretty good job of, of of kind of leading that. And obviously, there's a bunch of amazing talent that's within that company, and people didn't really know that they were there outside of Mexico, and uh, and now they're starting to to pay attention. You said I'm gonna start riots, and I'm gonna take this place global. I appreciate that. Basically, <laughs> yeah. Basically, yeah. <laughs> How many languages do you know? I have to ask, like just between uh, everywhere you've worked and everywhere yeah. you've worked like with consistency. My goodness. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I speak English, obviously. I'm actually not Cuban born. So that's actually. Oh, you're not? Okay. Yeah. No, Wiki, they tried to change it a couple of times on Wikipedia, but I'm not, you know, I was actually born in Los Angeles. My parents Please are. Please do research. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Everybody thinks it. Um, you know, obviously being, uh, you know, early on in my career, being, you know, part of the Havana Pitbulls, you know, that was a thing that was just a part of the uh, the character that we would say, you know, they were from Havana or whatever. But no, my my dad was born in Puerto Rico. My mom was born in, in New York, Puerto Rican descent. And uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I get that often. Whenever I go to Miami, I always get like Cuban Americans going up and be like, you're representing us so well. And I, I don't have the heart to tell them like, I'm not really, but... <laughs> Sure. But sure, cool. you know yeah. what? Yeah. We'll take it. You're not even um I, representing the East Coast. You were born in LA and your mom's a New Yorker. As a New Yorker, that's I a tough know. one for me to swallow, to be honest. So I know, I know. <laughs> but uh I'm working on my Spanish. It's a, it's a work in progress, you know. I, I definitely uh, have learned a lot of Spanish and I actually understand much more than I can speak. Um and then Japanese, uh, you know, I can speak I can order food. I can order when we sit down and go the places. I can kind of yeah. understand a lot. Yeah, the, the important <laughs> stuff, you know, from the day to day. Um, I don't speak well, and and I probably I just never really put in the the time to actually like study and learn. Uh, I tried like the first tour I was on, and I gave up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, you've but, been um, busy yeah. with some other things, it seems. <laughs> yeah, we've had a sure. lot going on. I think when people think of you, they think of um, CMLL and now MLW, which is great. And obviously your work in New Japan. Are there places in the world that you've wrestled that maybe that you 
have loved or have really great experiences in that we don't necessarily think of when we think of Rocky Romero? Any Anywhere off the beaten path? You know, uh, the last year I've gotten to work with, um, in Costa Rica quite a bit with uh, the Costa Rican Re wrestling embassy and uh, just a really great group of, of, of folks who love professional wrestling, like so much, you know, and um, it, it was cool to connect with them. And, and I did a couple of seminars and we just really clicked on a personal level, you know, and, and when you walk into a small group like that, who's maybe there's like 15 to 20 wrestlers, and you know everybody's training but they're this little community of wrestling in uh in costa rica and you know they're everything is limited right you know like they they can watch the stuff on the internet obviously and, and learn that way but you know having somebody who you know who has a, a bunch of experience come in and try to break it down for them and try to help them out as much as i can um it has been really cool so uh yeah just kind of seeing little groups like that kind of form where wrestling is not popular you know at all sure and uh it, it's kind of special and cool and it's got a you know definitely a special place in my heart because you know it's not definitely not about the money you know going down there it's it's definitely about kind of just the love of professional wrestling and and being able to um you know to 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 give people my experiences the best that i can so hopefully that you know makes them better in the future or or at least something that uh, they can pass on to the next generation that comes through, you know? So, uh, yeah, so that's been really special. I love wrestling in the UK. There's nothing like it, you know, soccer chants and it, taking you know, shoes everything. off. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just super, spe super special. And, um, and then obviously Mexico, I love Mexico just because it's so different and it's part of the culture there and, and the way that they, the fans are, with professional wrestling there it is really unique and really special and i i, just, I know I, I just love the culture because you'll be down there and there's so many like lucha references and in, in everything you know in in commercials and ads that are billboards and uh you know tv shows and and everything is, is definitely lucha related it's either like soccer or lucha which is cool so um, yeah, I think it's just really special to see that just be ingrained in, in the culture and, and in everyday life. Sure. That, that's awesome. And what you were saying about Costa Rica, um, the closest promotion to me probably in Jersey is WrestlePro. And they, mm -hmm. whenever they go to Alaska, it's been kind of a, a similar vibe and that it's such a big deal just because there's wrestling that's happening in Alaska that is like, with a, an effort that is brought in from the continental U.S. there because it is such a small community and anybody I know that's kind of done more of the educational side of it had similar sentiments of um, just how precious that connection feels because mm -hmm. anybody who's there to learn has so proactively sought it out in, in a similar way to, right. to your point where the accessibility factor is there. So it's cool to, to see those barriers break down in ways that you wouldn't even think about. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So in addition to wrestling all over the world, you've also wrestled in so many different contexts and worn so many different hats. So between being a singles wrestler in chaos in the Havana pit bulls, like you said, Rapunky Vites, do you have um, any preference in a specific type of wrestling? Do you prefer the multi-man matches or do you like getting to kind of go out there? be Rocky as a singles wrestler or is it yeah. all, all equal, but fun for you? I mean, it's definitely all equal, but fun, uh, in a way, uh, obviously like being a singles wrestler is way more challenging at times, uh, you know, because of it, the pressure is really just on you and your partner, as opposed to, you know, uh, me and Trent versus whoever, uh, you know, I can lean in on Trent quite a bit. So it also kind of depends on how tired I am and how how bad the travel sure. was and, <laughs> and all those factors. I really have, like, in theory, it's like, yeah, I want to wrestle on Dynamite or Rampage or Collision or whatever and have, like, an awesome singles match against Orange Cassidy. But I also don't want to do that every week because I'm exhausted all the time, you know, so. But, or or go to Arena Mexico and, and, and uh, you know, on a Friday night and, you know, there's 12,000 people there and you're, and all the pressure's on you. You're the main event. And, you know, uh, like, I don't know if the other guys think about that in CMO, but I'm, I'm, I'm you know, whenever I have like a, a big singles matches, like I'm constantly checking to see if they're, 
you know, how many tickets are out and if tickets are selling well. And then if they're not, you know, then I, you know, I'll call the office and say like, is there anything that I can do to, uh, you know, to, to help promote or anything, you know? So I'm like, I, I take it pretty seriously, especially if, if somebody's going to give me the ball to run with it. Like I, I want to be able to, you know, contribute as much as I can and sell tickets because, you know, it, it is on me, you know, I feel sure. like I feel the pressure. So, uh, so yeah, it's a big deal. And, uh, but yeah, anything I prefer, I mean, it, yeah, like I said, it kind of changes weekly day by day, you know, which I prefer, but I, I do like the, um, I do like the pressure though. The pressure is, is, is kind of, uh, is kind of fun in a way and the challenge, you know, cause I'm, I feel like I'm a person who's always trying to challenge myself in any kind of way. Like, uh, you know, I used to, you know, when people used to say that, you know, I didn't have any charisma or like this and that, or I wasn't good at promos or blah, 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 blah. You know, I would seek out ways to try to become better, you know, like I started taking acting classes and, and doing that really seriously so that I could feel as comfortable as I can in front of a camera and, and be able to portray who the character Rocky Romero is, you know, in, in a short amount of time. Cause that's really, you know, you don't get a lot of time when you're out there doing these things, you know, so uh, you have to try to make a connection right off the bat. So, um, you know, I never, I always felt good about the wrestling part. You know, I felt like I, w- I always excelled at that part, but I, I wanted to make sure that I could excel at the character part as well. So, uh, you know, I worked on it, you know, and I, and I challenged myself. So uh, now being able to use all that stuff now and, and, and getting opportunities to, to headline, then, uh, you know, I want to make sure I'm doing the job for everybody and that tickets are selling and, uh, and people actually want to come out and spend their hard-earned money to come see sure. wrestling and come see me, you know? It's really cool that we've gotten um, this kind of success from you in the ring at a time where I feel like so much of what we've seen from you has been outside of the ring aspects, too. You've just been kind of firing on all cylinders here. Um, commentary, booking, wrestling, brokering these relationships. Um that is a lot to take on. When I had Bad Dude Tito on this channel, he said, I don't think that guy ever sleeps. <laughs> Have you ever slept? And um, what is that like, even just from, I have ADHD. The fact that you can keep anything straight is impressive beyond me. But is there, um, does, it, does it ever feel like things are getting tugged at more than the other when you have so many roles to take on or does it all just kind of ebb and flow and and you've gotten a pretty good grip on on how you're able to measure taking on so many different aspects of a very robust and travel heavy industry <laughs> mm-hmm. uh you know what i mean you know i i I'm, i've the, this last year i've kind of like thought about it in season so like as we're getting you know approaching forbidden door I tried to, you know, make myself as accessible to AEW as possible. Uh, so whether it's coming in and traveling every week, just to get a, f- a few minutes with Tony here and there is is super helpful on my end. You know, just to go back to New Japan uh, and and vice versa. So if I'm, you know, on the phone with New Japan and and trying to figure out what the card is going to be or like who's coming and what dates, and I've got a great team on on both sides, you know. On, on the new Japan side, I've got an, an amazing team that helped me out so much and, and to kind of keep me focused too, because, you know, I, 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 I never say no. Right. So I'm, I'm always trying to take on everything. And I always think that I can, and sometimes I I need a little tug back to reality to be like, Hey, <laughs> you know, like, don't forget, this is what we're trying to do. And it's a big show and there's a lot of moving parts. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're right. And, uh, and also trying to balance that and strong, uh, it, is always challenging. Uh, but like I said, I have a, I have a great, and that, that's kind of like what I've kind of realized now is um, if you want to be a good leader and you, you obviously need a good team and you have to be able to, you know, let your team do the things that they need to do. So, you know, instead of trying to control everything, you know, I think in the beginning I felt like I was always like, well, if, there, if somebody's not going to do it, I'll edit the video. I'll do this. Da, da, da. <laughs> but like now it's like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, I, you know, it gives me a little more time to focus on on some of the important things too. Because you know, in reality, I can do the backstage stuff for forever. But uh, you know, uh, in ring, you know, there's going to be a time where I'm not going to be able to do it, and or I'm not going to be able to do it at the at the level that I want to. So it's going to be over. You know, so sure. I, I definitely want to use this time to to uh, you know to 
you know, I started out in professional wrestling to be a wrestler and, and to have all these cool opportunities and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm able to do them right now. So I, you know, I want to, you know, step on the gas and do it and, and, and do it at a high level. And, you know, one day I'll, I'll solely focus on backstage and, you know, that'll be the day, but, you know, I'm, I'm definitely just trying to do as much as I can to kind of set myself up for the future, uh, you know, and, and, and I always constantly think about obviously the future and, and what it holds. And, uh, you know, there'll be a day, like I said, where I'm not wrestling and, and I'll just focus on the other stuff. But, but until then, I feel like, you know, it's needed that I, I do as much as I can in both sides. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, personally, sure. and, uh, you know, for my goals, my ambitions, and, uh, like I said, what I set out to do. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky that people really want to work with new Japan and that, that opens up, you know, so many doors and uh, other opportunities. It, it's still kind of crazy when, um, you know, working with like MLW, for example, they you know, they were like, oh, well, we want guys from CMLL and uh and they're like okay but well, the first person we want is you I'm like me that's who you want you could have Mystico you could have all these people and uh they're like no no we, you know we think it's a good representation and a good way to to kind of start the relationship off so uh you know they gave me you know the MLW middleweight championship and and going back and forth uh between CMLL and uh and MLW and you know CMLL's got a great team too that's been super supportive and helpful in uh in starting that so I don't know. It's it, it's been a crazy year, and uh, I don't know. I'm ready to see what 2024 is. I, I feel like 2024. I need to maybe not go as hard as I went this year and kind of plan <laughs> it out a little better. And and I'm probably not going to do so many uh, independent shots and things like that next year. I think it, it'll be solely focused on you know the big the big companies uh, next year for me personally. Just because now it's we're getting into the weeds, and it, it feels like you know, I, I started all these relationships, so I got to make sure that they're all tended to uh, nicely, you know, so. Very um, polyamorous relationship right now <laughs> in exactly. wrestling. Well, before we dig into Forbidden Door, because that's just as a fan who got into wrestling in 2009, I didn't have like a, a world's collide in my life. So there's, it's very cool to see that. But to your point, New Japan's kind of been the bell of the ball, not only with New Japan Strong being such a, just honestly, like a, a very fun and refreshing sub-brand kind of of New Japan to have in the States, but we've seen the Impact Multiverse shows. You just alluded to the relationship between CMLL and MLW. Um, everybody's kind of found their their people to work with, and you are in the pot of, of all of those, which is really great. Um, do you feel like the the interpromotional i have to ask do you think we'll get like a super show at any point do you feel like things are healthy enough that we might be headed toward that direction or do you think it'll be people who are sweet on each other will continue to be sweet on each other <laughs> i mean i i think i definitely think it's possible i mean there's still obviously a lot of politics because you know wrestling in the end <laughs> well in the end, in the end they're they're all like all the companies in a way are rivals right like they're they're all competitors you know so you know i i think that there's definitely room for some kind of cool super show and and i definitely think um we'll we'll continue to see more of crossover events you know we'll definitely see more impact new japan crossovers we'll definitely still see obviously for vendor AEW new japan and but now yeah now you're talking you know maybe cmll can join you know the forbidden door in, in a sense you know and have some representation uh from their organization um but yeah one big super show i mean i i feel like it would probably be up to new japan to kind of head it you know and maybe it's in japan and maybe they'll invite all these different companies worldwide to have you know some kind of reps come in but um but yeah i i i think it's possible for sure when i don't know 2024 could be the time i don't know sure. <laughs> it, it, that, that part's not up to me so thank god so um you know but if they if they do decide you know i'll definitely be heavily involved for sure well and that makes sense because to your point it's a lot to choreograph in the sense that everybody has to benefit so um mm -hmm. that 
that's always something that impressed me about Forbidden Door. Impressive enough in the first one, even more so in the second one, I think, just because you less um, sidelining from injuries and plans changing and things like that. But mm -hmm. um, I know you had said kind of in the past that when AEW first started, the relationship was a little, no, no, I was going to say no pun intended, but now that I've said that it's kind of intended, it was a little rocky, right? It was a right, little bit, right. a little bit tricky. Right. And we've seen a couple of leadership changes now, obviously Tanahashi, be, Tanahashi being appointed president this week. Very, very cool development. Um, you are a huge player in bridging that trust. And you've also mentioned guys like Moxley and Jericho, and then finally Kenta kind of showing up in AEW. What happens in a situation like that? Like we had the pandemic, which um, while awful created some crossover opportunities that we might not have gotten right. But who's picking up the phone first? Do you already have a concept mapped out in your head or is it just kind of breadcrumbs leading to the feast? Hmm. Probably a mixture of all of it, you okay. know, in some kind of sure. way, you know, uh, now, you know, now we know Forbidden Door is on the schedule, you know, whether right. officially announced or not, you know, after doing two successful years, uh, you know, I, I, I would assume that everything would continue, uh, you know, because the success, you know, until it's not successful, I guess. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, you know, that's definitely on the docket. So yeah, now knowing that, I, I think this year was more crossover in the fact of like uh, New Japan and AEW were able to kind of have stuff that came after Forbidden Door. Obviously, like Brian Danielson versus Okada at the Tokyo Dome is something that started at, you know, storyline that started at Forbidden Door, you know. So, sure. um, so you know, now, now we're going to kind of see more things like that storyline wise, uh, you know, I assume. So, you know, Forbidden Door being such a big deal on both sides that, uh, you know, the, the year before was a little tough because, you know, getting visas and everything was not super easy still in Japan. So, uh, you know, not, not that it's like the easiest now, but you know, it takes time to get a visa and do, and do certain things. But I, I feel like now for, for next year's forbidden door, hopefully we'll have more crossover stuff from AEW coming to Japan to help set up angles as well as a, as well as new Japan wrestlers coming to AEW pre, uh, pre, um, forbidden door. So, uh, and then, and seeing what storylines come out of that, right. Building to other opportunities and other events, whether in, they're in the States or whether they're in Japan as well. So, uh, yeah, it's a mixture of, of all that. And the same thing with Impact, you know, Impact in New Japan, obviously being on Access TV is, you know, kind of makes this a, a, a little more cohesive in a way. Um, so if we if we decide to do another multiverse and depending on where it's at, then then both sides will be needed to kind of create the angles and, and create the storylines out of that to, to make a successful pay-per-view. I think a lot of people are fully aware of how much booking must be a challenge when you're thinking about like, it almost has to get 50, 50 for someone not to <laughs> like the card has to get 50, 50 in a way for someone not to feel like um, one side has an overwhelming advantage, or obviously you don't want champions looking weak or any of that with booking. You alluded to visas. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges that maybe aren't running through fans minds of, how far out you might have to be booking storylines if you did want to include Wrestle Kingdom in it or right. or visas like what are what are those logistics that maybe we aren't thinking about? Well, I mean, honestly, like for example, I mean, just I feel like AEW New Japan is an easy example, but you know, there are two promotions that are running hundreds of shows, you know, sure. per year, you know, <laughs> you know, so. So just scheduling out certain things that are difficult because you never know, right? Like, and plus, um, you know, there was a time in AEW where, you know, it seemed like every star was getting hurt, right? So it was like, can you depend on what you're thinking about what's going to happen in six months? If that, you know, we don't even know sometimes if those people will even be available, you know, sure. at, at that moment. So, so there's a lot of stuff that goes back and forth and, um, and and obviously, like I said, like New Japan runs a, a full time schedule, you know, and not only do they, you know, do big events, but they also have house shows weekly, pretty much. So it very difficult when um, the, the funny thing was like the first Forbidden Door 
you know, Okada was the last one to be announced, right? It was the the Wednesday before. And I remember watching fans, you know, being so upset that why Okada's not going to be there? Like, what? where's Okada? Where's Okada? It's like, hey, of course Okada's going to be there. <laughs> like, <laughs> of course. You know? But also Okada's a megastar who, you know, who has, you know, all, all kinds of things lined up all the time, TV shows and, and other kinds of things, not only with the wrestling. So, and plus he's got a, you know, he, if he's doing house show for a week to, to pop into America on a Wednesday or a Saturday is extremely difficult, you know? So, so yeah. So I always thought it was funny because the plan was always to have Okada be the last one to, to show up, you know, to kind of finalize the card. So, um, but, but I, I did also love that. I thought it created like a nice tension that people were, were talking about it. Right. And that's what you want. You want chatter. You want people to be on X talking about it and, and complaining about, you know, like where oh, is he going to show up? Is he not going to show up? I mean, that's wrestling, right? You know, so kind of building that anticipation was, was kind of awesome in the end. But um, but yeah, when he finally showed up, I mean, he got the biggest pop I think of the weekend. You know, so um, the crowd was was insane. So I don't know. It, it, it's it stuff like that is definitely difficult. So you know, now you know now that Tanahashi's president, you know, maybe it'll be a little smoother because you know, in in a way, because I think New Japan now can think. Okay, the four weeks, be, you know, before this pay per view, you know, let's try to lighten the schedule, maybe, so that we can be accessible to start creating storylines with AEW on on uh, on American TV. You know, obviously, their their global reach is much bigger than New Japan, so it, it kind of a lot of stuff kind of needs to happen there. But also in the fact of like, let's get some AEW stars and to start creating the storylines even before that. You know, sure, sure, and I think on the Japan side. Yes, and you kind of alluded to it before of that New Japan is so live events focused and AEW is so TV focused. You kind of have to satiate both crowds in, in that way or, mm -hmm. or fulfill almost both compulsories to get yourselves to that pay-per-view. Um, it seems like an overwhelmingly positive response to Tanahashi taking over, as you were just kind of saying. Are you excited being so in the fold to to kind of kick off this new era that's that's swiftly approaching or has arrived i guess in a sense <laughs> yeah uh you know i i think it's cool that uh, you know we haven't had a, a wrestler president for 20 plus years i believe i think the last one was fujinami so and that was like right when i started in new japan in 2002 he signed my first contract so uh i, oh. I remember <laughs> yeah going to the to the office for the first time uh, and and meeting with uh, with Mr. Fujinami and and him saying hello and and it was just really cool uh, experience in general. So to have um, to ta have Tanahashi leading now and, and kind of heading, you know, he's the captain of the ship. Uh, I think it's cool. I, I I think obviously you know I think it's good for the wrestlers and the fact that um, anything that was maybe not addressed or you know wasn't completely understood by by the you know office type people you know who come business type people who come in you know they they forget that in the end you know wrestlers yeah we're the products but we're also humans too you know so you know it's that being able to schedule things correctly and also giving you know proper time off and and certain things uh you know it is demanding so i think having somebody like that being a representation of that is is super important for the future and um and I, and obviously there's no better person I think to represent and kind of be the face of the company than the guy who gave his body for so many years to you know the resurrection of New Japan was all built around Hiroshi Tanahashi you know so like he knows the business better than anybody else and I also think that he's you know a super super smart individual himself he uh, you know he went to basically like the Harvard of Japan and you know he's he's a very he's intelligent a law degree, guy. right something like that i'm not yeah. sure i just know he played baseball i, I know he played baseball, played baseball. Know he went to the, one, yeah, one of the best schools in uh in japan so uh so yeah so having a, a you know person like that i feel like he you know he's definitely qualified for the position and um and it, i think it's i think it's good for the company in the long term you know we, we we've had presidents that come in you know for three years or so and then the next president comes in another three years. So 
you know, I hope for Tanahashi that it's it's you know a long uh, you know reign as as president. You know, so I, sure. you know you know six years, nine years, some you know even longer maybe, so that he can make a difference. You know, and, and have the time to actually do it. Um, and I, I definitely think on the wrestler side, I think there's not a wrestler in New Japan who's who's not excited about having one of your own head sure. the company and, and represent the company. I think it's super important. And I think in a time that New Japan is kind of in a rebuilding period, you know, so, you know, we, we need to build uh, new stars and, and uh, take advantage of all these, the great talent that we actually have in the company. I, you know, I, I feel like Tana understands that because he was that, right? Like he was a guy who, you know, was in the undercard, you know, had just, you know, graduated from the dojo and then, you know, was, was able to climb the ranks fairly quickly to become, uh, you know, the new Japan's most valuable asset, you know? So I feel like, you know, he, he understands what that means and he can also help, help to give guidance, uh, to those wrestlers, you know, guys like Shota, Umino and Renarita and Yotsuji and Yuya. I mean, those are like the four guys, right? So yeah, I, I think he can he can he can give them and and give them the opportunities outside that are are necessary, right? Like giving them, uh, you know, helping to organize. You know, this is the person we want to focus on. This is the person who maybe should be on TV. I know we have some of our older guys who are more famous, you know, but like we also need to to make sure that they're represented in the in the public uh, as much as we can, you know. And things are kind of built around them and and. and in a general sense. Sure. And I think you raise a really good point in that wrestlers live very weird little lives. And so to have someone that can empathize and has been in the wrestler mm -hmm. position and understands fully um, what an all encompassing job it is and what it takes. I mean, who got them on a higher, more like a golden era really was, was so built around Tanahashi to your point. So, mm -hmm. and I mean, you can't just have people throwing out fines like Brian Danielson finding you for no reason. You know what I mean? You gotta have people. If there's gonna be wrestlers in positions of authority, they can't just be throwing fines out like they are in America. Here. Right. I mean, my God. And then do, do I pay it? And what happens if I don't pay it? Like, like what yeah. currency? Do you have to pay it in America? And where does it? Yeah. What yeah. are we? Where does it go? Pockets? Does it go straight yeah. to Brian's pocket? Like, does it go to Tony? <laughs> like, what's going on here? You know, I need more information. I'm gonna try to find out this week. I think I think you should. I think before you pay okay. any money, treat yourself through this holiday season as we're wrapping up here. And then you know what? If they get you your answers in the new year, consider it maybe. But I don't I'll know consider it. about this Brian <laughs> Danielson authority figure around <laughs> backstage. But before we get out of here, I did want to my favorite question to ask people is what is the one thing that you're most proud of that most people probably don't know about? Oh, uh, that's why I like to ask it. It's a tricky one. Mm. Mm. Wow. Uh, you know, I end on a thinker. It's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, well, I guess, I guess what's cool to me is I've, I've created a lot of music for a lot of wrestlers and, and, uh, a lot of factions <laughs> I'll just yeah, say, that are uh, that are kind of iconic uh, and cool so it, it that was like um always kind of a side thing that i did for fun and uh you know writing music and creating music on my laptop and, and things like that so uh being able to do it now and 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 you know working with some some pretty big um wrestlers that it's kind of cool to to see that that part of of my life which is just a personal fun part to kind of come out and, and being able to uh to you know accepted by the masses and and kind of loved and you know by the masses and and kind of i don't know it's just something cool so, for me yeah, yeah 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 music is like my favorite way to make sense of the world so i love that mm -hmm. like whenever somebody goes out of their way to make music a, a vital part of their presentation i'm always like seeking out more about that so that's very cool i love that yeah i love that yeah. well before we get out of here if there's anything that you wanted to leave people with or anything that you wanted to plug now's the time <laughs> uh yeah wrestle kingdom is coming up january 4th and january 
third will it be, I guess, the US, I'm not sure. But anyway, January 4th is the, is the day at Wrestle Kingdom. It's going to be an amazing card. Uh, obviously, you're not going to want to miss it. It's one of the most premier events in professional wrestling. But I'm sure if you're already watching this uh, this show, then you're probably already into New Japan and have already checked out uh, what New Japan is all about. But like I said, you know, I think this year is going to be a really interesting year in New Japan in general from the office situation, you know, Tanashi becoming president, you know, to, to seeing who steps up as, uh, you know, as the next big thing within the company. And um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a really exciting year. So uh, it all starts, it always starts at Wrestle Kingdom and ends at the next Wrestle Kingdom. So it, it's going to be a wild ride. And if you aren't watching New Japan, what are you doing? Get over, watch some New Japan Always seek out as much wrestling as you can. That's kind of the point of the series. I'm a big proponent in learning from past wrestling and exploring forms of storytelling in ways that maybe aren't the world most accessible to you or that you haven't experienced yet. So get out there. Watch some New Japan if you haven't. Rocky, you have one of the coolest like legacies in wrestling, in my opinion. I think it's so awesome that alongside this in-ring career, you have interconnected so many promotions over the past couple years. And I thank you so much for taking your time during this very busy. Well, it sounds like it was quieter for you, but chaotic at least. <laughs> for sure. Holiday season. Always chaos. It's always, always chaos. chaos. It's not, I mean, it's not, it's, chaos. It's, it's not a gimmick. It's it's real life. Yeah. Oh, it I is. should also plug Battle in the Valley, January thirteenth. New Japan Strong presents. Uh, you know, there's there's been uh, some awesome talent that's already been announced. Uh, I heard Will Ospreay's trying to get a match with Kazuchika Okada, so we'll see how that goes. And um, But yeah, it's going to be a, a great pay-per-view on Fight TV, Fight.TV, or now Triller TV. If you've been paying attention, they changed their name to Triller TV. So uh, yeah, it's going to be an awesome event, pr another premiere event for New Japan Strong in America, and uh, highlighting what New Japan does best. Yes, I have loved the New Japan Strong brand this year as much as any. I've, I've fallen so in love with it. It's a super, super fun watch. So please follow Rocky. Please follow New Japan and New Japan Strong. A lot of great wrestling out there. The series continues. We've gotten through Australia. We've got Rocky here talking about global wrestling all over the world. We've got so much more. We're going to continue this series until I run out of places to, to talk about where there's awesome <laughs> wrestling happening around the world. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one. You too.